Subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, all members may have five days to submit statements, questions, extraneous materials for the record, subject to the length limitation in the rules. I will make my opening statement. Two years ago, Iran and six major world powers reached an agreement regarding its program of nuclear capability. That deal was the result of a decade of tough U.S. and international sanctions placed on the Iranian regime because of its dangerous nuclear ambitions. The mullahs in Tehran felt the pain of sanctions. That's why they came to the negotiating table. At that moment, we had the most leverage over the regime, but unfortunately, the deal that the past administration brokered turns out to be seriously flawed. For starters, the deal simply put Iran, Iran's nuclear plans on hold for 10 to 15 years. After that time, Iran is free to develop a nuclear weapon and menace the world. Even worse, the deal did not address Iran's continued sponsorship of terrorists with American blood on their hands. It also did nothing to curb the development of ballistic missiles. Iran gained immediate access to hundreds of billions of dollars and the promise of yet more to come due to the sanctions relief. Only weeks after the announcement of the deal, reports indicated that Iran had significantly increased funding to Hezbollah and Hamas, both terrorist groups. This increased funding allowed Hezbollah to increase its operations in Syria, where the group has deepened its sectarian divide. Hezbollah has also used this new funding to obtain highly developed new armaments, including advanced technologies used by professional state militaries. While Hezbollah has been busy helping its Iranian masters prop up the brutal Assad regime in Syria, they have contact, contracted out their violently anti-Israel agenda. In 2016, Israeli authorities arrested a Palestinian cell organized and funded by Hezbollah that had planned to carry out suicide bombings. Iran also cemented its ties with the Palestinian terror group Hamas by providing them with missile technologies that enable them to build their own rockets to target Israeli citizens. Iran helped Hamas build its terrorist tunnel infrastructure that was destroyed by Israel in 2014. Since the nuclear deal, Iran terrorist plots have been uncovered in Kuwait, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia. Hezbollah and Iran also remain active in Latin America, where they operate criminal networks that yield even more money for Tehran to invest in terrorism. Back at home in Iran, the mullahs are busy dedicating more time and money to their ballistic missile program. Since the announcement of the nuclear deal, Iran has connect, contact, conducted 14 ballistic missile tests. Earlier this month, Iran attempted to launch a cruise missile from one of its midget submarines, same type of submarines the terrorist regime in North Korea is developing. Iran and North Korea are the only countries that deploy this class of submarine. The failed test reminded the world of Iran and, nuclear, and North Korea's long history of co collaboration on the ballistic and even nuclear programs. The dangerous relationship goes all the way back to the 1980s. Now the two rogue regimes are believed to be working on developing intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs. Why is Iran moving ahead with ballistic missile program? Because Ballistic missiles are the best delivery system for nuclear weapons. So while they wait 10 years till they can develop a bomb, Iran is ensuring they have the technology to deliver that payload. And there are some doubts about whether Iran is actually complying with the deal. Members of the National Council of Resistance of Iran claimed last month that Iran is still working on weaponization, the final step on the path to nuclear weapons. It is clear this deal has allowed the mullahs to, mullahs to increase their support of terrorism and proliferation. Leading up to the deal, the past administration assured us that the U.S. would continue the fight against Iran's malign behavior. It's time now we get serious about that. We cannot allow Iran to continue threatening the United States and our allies unchecked. The question is, how do we do that? That's why we're having this hearing, and we have these three experts that will give us the answers to all of that. And I will now yield to the gentleman from Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Keating, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Poe, and thank you for the witnesses that are here today to testify. Uh, this hearing is very timely, coming less than a week after the re-election uh, re of Iranian President Rouhani. 
who was a key figure in reaching the nuclear agreement. It also comes at a time when President Trump uh, is making his first uh, trip abroad in a sphere threatened by Iran's malign acts. So it's fitting that we take up Iran and the subcommittee this afternoon, as this is a time when both countries are reassessing their security posture towards each other. I supported and continue to support the Iran nuclear deal because it made us and our allies more secure and brought Iran more in line with international principles of nonproliferation. I also support aggressive, robust monitoring and enforcement of the deal so that we're certain that Iran never wavers in upholding their commitments under the agreement. However, Iran's nuclear ambitions were not the only threat they posed to the region and to the United States' security interests. Iran has continued to conduct several ballistic missile tests in defiance of UN Security Council Resolution 2231 and to support terrorist organizations operating throughout the region. <coughs> it's actively involved in the civil conflicts in Syria and in Yemen, and as a result is exacerbating the continued bloodshed in both countries and further stalling resolutions to these conflicts. Iran's human rights record is also appalling. Participation in civic life is severely restricted, with the regular arrest of journalists and activists and repression of free speech, not to mention the ongoing imprisonment of American citizens. The United States' posture towards Iran must take into account all layers of Iran's aggressive stance towards the world. However, that also includes taking into account the powerful role of the Iranian public opinion as we consider U.S. policies towards Iran and our response to Iranian threats to stability and security, we cannot do so without so also considering Iran's domestic context and recognizing that the President, President Rouhani, just received broad support from a diverse range of voters in Iran on Friday. Here in Congress and within the U.S. government, we must be committed to curbing Iran's malign activities, and we must do so diligently. Iran's destabilizing actions throughout the Middle East threatens the United States and must be met with clear condemnation for the sake of the countless human lives at stake and of, global, of the global rule of law. Yet we must take note of the complex reality that accounts for domestic, the domestic context in Iran today. Therefore, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses uh, and, and hear about how Congress can navigate these many security threats from Iran without running afoul of our international commitments, without backsliding on progress made so far and bringing Iran into compliance with international law and norms. With the re-election of President Rouhani, I believe we must seize any possible opportunity to move forward in curbing Iran's support for terrorist organizations, undeterred ballistic missile testing, continued involvement in conflicts across the region, and its gross human rights violations. We should do so with the support of our allies, and our action should be carried out swiftly, yet deliberately. I thank the witnesses. I look forward to your testimony. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman for his comments. Uh, the chair will now have uh, opening statements uh, by members of uh, the committee. Uh, one minute opening statements. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mast. Thank you for recognizing me. I appreciate it, and uh, thank you for your testimonies. I just uh, think it's important on the heels of Memorial Day that we really identify what it looks like for Iran to be the largest state sponsor of terrorists. It's become a phrase that's become so cliche uh, in, uh, in recent past. And what that really means on the heels of Memorial Day is it's uh, Iranian hands that have made uh, IEDs, explosively formed projectiles that tore through our up armor Humvees in Iraq. And it's Iranian uh, hands that, that packed uh, improvised explosives explosive devices with nuts and screws and bolts and so many pieces of shrapnel that were placed in places like Afghanistan to put so many holes in our service members that they could never be plugged before, before they bled out. That's what it looks like to be the, the largest state sponsor of terror, and I just think it's important that we keep that as a frame of reference, especially on the heels of Memorial Day as we have this conversation. I thank you for your time testifying today, and I look forward to hearing from you. I thank the gentleman from Florida. The chair will recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Boyle. Thank you to the uh, chair and ranking member. I, I, I would say that, um, and I happen to have been someone on the Democratic side of the aisle who voted against the uh, Iran deal, and I know there were good principled arguments on, on both sides of that. What I'm most interested in, though, is not 
continuing to beat a dead horse of the political fight over this and moving beyond the politics of the deal and whether or not it was a good idea and accepting the reality and moving forward and specifically focusing on, and my comments very much dovetail after the last ones we just heard, going after Iranian funding for Hamas, for Hezbollah, for their continued role in the Syrian civil war, for what they're doing in Yemen. I believe that should be our focus, and rather than continuing to relitigate the past of the Iran deal, let's focus on that, uh, because in the end of the day, it's cliche for a reason. They are the largest state sponsor of terrorism throughout the world, and that will continue unless we go after their uh, funding. Thank you. I yield back. Chairman yields back his time. Without objection, all of the witnesses' prepared statements will be made part of the record. I ask that each witness keep their presentation to no more than five minutes. When the red light comes on in front of you, that means stop, and I will help you enforce that rule. I'll introduce each witness and give them time for their opening statements. Elan Berman is a senior vice president of the American Foreign Policy Council. He is an expert on regional security in the Middle East and has consulted for both the CIA and the Department of Defense. Dr. Ray Takei is a senior fellow for Middle East Studies at the Council of Foreign Relations. Prior to joining the CFR, he was a senior advisor on Iran at the State Department. And Dr. Daniel Byman is a senior fellow in the Center for Middle East Policies at Brookings. His research focuses on counterterrorism and Middle East security. Mr. Berman, we will start with you, and you have five minutes. Oh, thank you, Judge Poe. Uh, and thank you, Judge, and thank you, Ranking Member Keating, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to discuss the 2015 nuclear deal between Iran and the P5 plus one powers. Um, more than a, a good place to start is to recognize that more than a year after its implementation, the effects of the agreement have been profound, and they've been profoundly negative, uh, both for the stability of the Middle East and for American interests there. Uh, and uh, much of this problem revolves around the fact that while the agreement was only intended to be tactical in nature, to deal strictly with one aspect of the global threat that's posed by Iran, its effects uh, for Iran have been both uh, extensive and they've been strategic in nature. Uh, most notably, uh, and I, I have a, a more detailed discourse in my uh, written uh, statement, which you have in front of you, but most notably, I would point out that uh, the JCPOA has had a material effect on reinvigorating the global ambitions of a regime that truly thinks globally, that thinks about itself as a regional hegemon and as, as a country with power projection capabilities far beyond its borders. And you can see this uh, evident uh, in several uh, lines of effort that the Iranian regime is pursuing currently. The first is a multi-spectrum military modernization that is both reinvigorated and it's sustained in nature. And it encompasses things like the expansion of Iran's national defense budget to 5% of GDP, uh, the acquisition of billions of dollars of new hardware uh, from, uh, client, uh, from supplier states like Russia and China, and substantially deeper investments in cyber warfare capabilities, both for, for defense and for offense. Um, you can see Iran's uh, focus on stepped-up regional activism, including greater assistance to the Assad regime in Syria, uh, and uh, also serving as a facilitator for a secondary state-directed foreign fighter flow uh, that is bringing uh, Afghans, Yemenis, uh, Shiites of uh, non-Syrian origin to the Syrian battlefront. And you can see this in the solidification of uh, Iranian uh, influence uh, over Iraqi politics through its extensive sponsorship of both Shiite militias and patronage of uh, Shiite politicians in Iraq. And uh, also, as, as all the members noted, uh, you see a substantial surge in the amount of money, already extensive, that Iran has uh, allocated towards uh, the activities of uh, organizations like Hezbollah in Lebanon and also in Syria and uh, Hamas in the Palestinian territories. The cumulative effect of this is that uh, General Joseph Hotel, the commander of U.S. Central Command, uh, testified uh, about approximately a month and a half ago that uh, 
these initiatives have made Iran, quote, the most significant threat to the central region and to our national interests and to the interests of our partners and allies there. Uh, and I think that's a, a significant uh, development uh, and is a significant uh, escalation in the threat that's posed by Iran. Uh, and, and this, I think, leads us to the question of what can be done. Um, I think that the Trump administration's Iran policy is still a work in progress. Uh, they are undergoing a uh, comprehensive policy review that's going to touch on all aspects of uh, Iran policy, including the nuclear deal and uh, other issues. But as they do, I think they would be very well advised to focus on three priorities, uh, four priorities, excuse me. Uh, the first is to reestablish economic leverage over Iran. Uh, the JCPOA has put in motion a fundamental unraveling of the global sanctions regime against Iran for a host of reasons. And Washington needs to restore the economic leverage that it once had against uh, Iran. And it can do so through measures like the additional blacklisting of uh, illicit uh, entities engaged in illicit behavior, and also uh, a comprehensive blacklisting on uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, which controls uh, a third or more of Iran's national economy. The second priority should be to ensure compliance with the terms of the nuclear deal, because uh, as much as uh, termination of the JCPOA was a campaign issue last year, it's abundantly clear that uh, the contours of the agreement will remain in force, at least for the near future. And that means that we have to focus on ensuring compliance w uh, in material terms, uh, the hiring of additional inspectors, gaining access to facilities that are currently obscured, and most of all, constructing a menu that talks about uh, what constitutes a material breach of the agreement so that all the members of the P5 plus one can be on the same page about whether Iran is in violation of, of its uh, obligations. The other two, uh, very briefly, the other two uh, priorities that the administration should focus on would be mechanisms by which it can constrain Iranian expansionism to include the construction of a regional security architecture uh, very much uh, along the lines of what uh, the Trump administration has begun discussing in its current trip uh, to the Middle East. Uh, and lastly, the uh, reconstruction of American credibility vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian people. Uh, historically, the United States has served as a champion for ordinary Iranians in their struggle against the uh, clerical state. This is a moral high ground that the U.S. has retreated from over the last eight years in the service of a tactical arrangement with the Iranian regime. And this is ground that we need to make up, and we can make this up in a number of different ways, from uh, different statements to uh, more robust broadcasting to uh, other demonstrations of the fact that this administration is not prepared to accept the current political status quo uh, in Tehran. And the time to do so, in my opinion, is now. Uh, the U.S. government needs to move robustly to implement a new approach that begins to roll back Iranian influence uh, and activities in the region, activities that have been emboldened uh, in no small measure by the agreement that was signed in July of 2015. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berman. <clears throat> Dr. Takei. Uh, thank you. I, I know from previous uh, representations in front of Judge Poe, five minutes means five minutes. <laughs> so I'll stay diligently within the time frame that I'm sure you'll insist upon. Uh, uh, the terrorism, the use of political violence, uh, is an enduring aspect of the Islamic Republic. The regime's victims, as was mentioned, span the region, but the most vulnerable targets of that state-sponsored violence have always been the Iranian people themselves. Uh, the key actors defining Iran's regional policies are not its diplomats, but its Revolutionary Guard Corps, particularly the famed Ghost Brigade, for the commander of the Ghost Brigade, General Soleimani. The struggle to evict America from the region began in Iraq, has now moved to Syria. For the hardliners, the Sunni state's attempt to dislodge Bashar Assad is really a means of weakening Iran. Thus, the survival and success of the Assad regime at this point is one of the central elements of Iranian foreign policy. The question then becomes what impact the nuclear deal have on Iran and its regional surge. Uh, the proponents of the agreement at one point insisted that whatever windfall there was would be funneled for domestic purposes and Iran's depleted economy. Uh, by their telling, Iran had prioritized its malign activities even during the times of economic stress. Two years later, we see some of the aspect of those claims can be, cannot be substantiated. Iran's defense budget has gone up by 
about 50%. It used to be about 2.7% of the GDP. Now, between now and year 2020, it's likely to be 5% of the GDP. So it's about doubled. Iran's model for operating in the Middle East today is drawn from its experiences in Lebanon in the early 1980s. It was at that time that Iran amalgamated various Shi parties into the lethal Hezbollah. In essence, Iran created a militia outside the control of the weak Lebanese state. In the meantime, Iran sought to manipulate the politics of Lebanon to its advantage by making sure that the central government remains weak. A decentralized state, not in full command of course of power, is a model that Iran has used first in Lebanon and now in Iraq and, of course, in Syria. Since the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, Iran has sought to take advantage of the disorder there and extend its influence. The Islamic Republic has trained Shi militias, as was mentioned, that are responsive to its orders and has sh sought to uh, sharpen the sectarian divide in Iraq as a means of dividing that nation against itself. The rise of Islamic State has actually provided Iran an opportunity for further inroads in Iraq. Under the auspices of fighting the Islamic State, Iran has further projected its power in that nation. So long as Iraq's trouble continue, Iran can be counted on to further exacerbate them. Since the beginning of the Syrian civil war, Iranian officials maintained that the Assad regime will survive. This assessment stood in contrast to those of Western powers who assured themselves that the forward march of history would envelop the Syrian dictator. The Iranian model of operation in Syria, again, is very much similar to that of Iraq and uh, previous to that of Lebanon. Uh, once more, Iran deployed to develop militias outside the control of the state, deployed large number of revolutionary guards and Hezbollah proxies, and essentially took command of the ground forces. Without Iranian assistance and guidance, Syrians may have been spared some of the carnage that has wrecked their country. Uh, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei today stands as the most successful Persian imperialist in history of Iran. In the 1970s, at the height of his power, the Shah did not enjoy commanding influence in Iraq. Lebanon's confessional politics eluded him, and the Assad regime was not a mere subsidiary of Iran, and the Persian Gulf states resisted his pretensions. Today, Iran has essential control of much of the Iraqi state. It is the most important external actor in Syria, and Hezbollah provides it with not just means of manipulating Lebanese politics, but also shock troops that can be deployed in various war fronts. It is important to appreciate that actually Israel remains the principal victim of Iranian terrorism. Iran's hostility toward Israel is one of the most enduring and perplexing aspects of its history. Iran's animosity toward Israel can be traced back to the founding of his revolution, in the eyes of the founder of the revolution, the creation of Israel was the most unforgettable sin. In a perverse way, Iran's opposition to Israel exceeds even its opposition to the United States because it objects to various American acts, not to its existence as it does with Israel. A regime as dangerous to U.S. interests as Islamic Republic requires, as was mentioned, a comprehensive strategy to counter it. This means exploiting all of Iran's vulnerabilities, increasing the cost of its foreign adventures, weakening its economy, Supporting its domestic discontents, pursuing this strategy will take time, but eventually it will put the United States in a position to impose terms on Iran. And we should, as was mentioned, put human rights at the top of agenda, not look the other way as Iran's leaders oppress their people. And my time has ran out exactly at five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Byman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to emulate Dr. Takei. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Keating, members of this uh, subcommittee, thank you very much for this opportunity to testify. Iran's terrorism and destabilization efforts are primarily a threat to U.S. interests and U.S. allies in the Middle East. Support for militant and terrorist groups in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and elsewhere enabled Tehran to shore up key allies like the Syrian regime of Bashar al-Assad. It also gives Iran leverage with regional rivals like Saudi Arabia. And ties to militant groups strengthen pro-Iran voices in the region, increasing Iran's influence in some of the capitals in the region, but also in some of the more remote hinterlands. Iran believes that support for militants pays policy dividends. The Assad regime, once petering, is now ascendant, or at least in a stronger position. Iran's support to various groups in Iraq have given Iran uh, Tehran influence at both the local and national level, and Hezbollah has proven a loyal ally that has helped Iran project its influence in Lebanon and in neighboring states and against Israel. Iran does not appear to be actively targeting the U.S. homeland with terrorism. 
but its capacity remains latent. Tehran uses its ability to strike U.S. assets outside war zones to deter the United States and as a contingency should the United States attack Iran. Iran spends billions of dollars on supporting its proxies and deploying its own military forces. This is a huge sum for a country with significant economic problems and a limited military budget. In addition, the nuclear deal raised expectations of economic improvements among the Iranian people, and spending more on militants abroad makes it harder for the regime to satisfy these demands at home. For the Trump administration to better counter Iranian influence in the Middle East, it should seize the opportunity to reset U.S. relations with key regional allies. Many Middle Eastern allies had lost faith in the Obama administration, and several, notably Israel and Saudi Arabia, are going to elaborate lengths to ignore the missteps and often contradictory behavior of the Trump administration in hopes of closer cooperation. Additional pressure on entities like the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps would help send the right message to allies and to Iran. Washington should also highlight the costs of Iran's adventurism to ordinary Ar Iranians to raise domestic awareness and discontent with the regime's foreign policy. The United States should step up efforts to build a credible and moderate Syrian opposition to put additional pressure on Iran's Syrian ally. And in Yemen, Washington should support negotiations to end the war, as the current Saudi approach is giving both Iran and the Al-Qaeda affiliate in Yemen an opportunity to expand their influence. At the same time, the Trump administration must remember that Iran can push back. The 2015 nuclear deal, for all its flaws, remains better than any current plausible alternative, and pulling out of the agreement would be a mistake. In addition, Iran has leverage and many vulnerabilities to exploit, given its role in fighting the Islamic State and the exposure of U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria to Iranian-directed violence. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for this opportunity to testify. I thank uh, all of you all for uh, your testimony. I'll recognize myself <clears throat> for some questions. Um, I've introduced uh, H.R. 478, the IRGC Terrorist Sanctions Act and it would designate the IRGC for its terrorist activity under Executive Order 13224. I want to ask each of you if you support that concept or you don't, and it's either a yes or a no. Mr. Berman? I do, sir. Dr. Takei? Yes, sir. And Dr. Byman? Yes, sir. Um, there are many things that I would like to go into, uh, but uh, let me just start with the first one, uh, Mr. Berman. You mentioned that the United States needs to develop a better relationship with the Iranian people, letting them understand that it's the regime that we don't support, but we support the people of Iran to be able to have self-determination to rule their own country and uh, not the mullahs. Can you expound on how we could do that? I can try, sir. Um, I, I think that uh, a relatively underutilized tool uh, that the United States has at its disposal is our ability to bypass the regime and communicate directly to the Iranian people through mechanisms like the Voice of America's Persian News Network uh, and other broadcasting tools. Uh, and here, what we say is as important as how loud we say it. Um, programming that emphasizes the endemic corruption within the regime, uh, that elevates the plight of individual political prisoners that are being maligned by the regime, that demonstrates uh, to the Iranian people that the, uh, despite the economic benefits of the JCPOA, there has been no trickle-down effect uh, that have benefited the ordinary Iranians. All of those things, I think, would help uh, diminish uh, the credibility of the Iranian regime elevate America's standing in the eyes of the Iranian people, uh, and uh, really, I think, uh, amplify all of the other elements of the Trump administration's strategy as it begins to be formed. So, if I understand you correctly, we should do everything we can to let the world and the Iranian people know that we support them in changing the regime in a peaceful way. That should be the U.S. policy as opposed to ultimate conflict militarily with Iran. Is that a yeah, fair statement? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, all of you mentioned Assad and also mentioned Iraq. Uh, what is Syria's relationship to Iran? Is it a puppet state? Same question 
about Iraq? Is Iraq becoming a puppet state of Iran? How would you characterize that relationship with Iran and those two countries? Mr. Berman, you first. Absolutely. I'll, I'll go very quickly and I'll uh, allow my colleagues to step in. I, I think it's necessary to think about Syria in the context of, of what it does for Iran, both as a strategic partner and as a buffer state. Uh, Syria is part of that axis of resistance that uh, Iran, Iranian officials continually talk about, uh, withstanding pressure from the West, from the United States, and from Israel. Uh, Syria is a very important link in that axis because of the land bridge that it provides to Iran's chief terrorist proxy, Hezbollah, in Lebanon. And the idea in, uh, of a Syria that is no longer managed by a compliant partner, that is balkanized or is uh, subverted by a radical Sunni group, is anathema to Iran's long-term strategic interests, which goes a long way towards explaining why Iran has sunk so much blood and treasure into preserving the current status quo in Syria. Dr. Takei? I would agree with that on Syria. Uh, I would actually uh, suggest that I wouldn't characterize Iraq as a state that today is a subsidiary of, of Iran. I think Iraqis don't want to be proxies of Iran. Iraq has institutions. It has some sort of a democratic structure, highly imperfect. Uh, and there is a lot of discussion nowadays about pushing back on Iran in the region. I think the place that one can do so perhaps as effectively as elsewhere, would be in Iraq, because Iraq has a history of being the seat of Arab civilization as opposed to being a subsidiary of a Persian empire. Uh, and I do think Iraqi politicians really across the board would like to be emancipated from the Iranian influence. There are a lot of reasons they're not. They're not welcome. Iraq is not welcome in the Council of Sunni Arab Powers. That's something the United States can work on. And gradual integration of Iraq as a Shi'i state in a Sunni Arab emphasizing their ethnic identity. So I think Iraq is a place where it's struggling to be free of Iran. But it's Let me ask you this last question. <clears throat> Dr. Bauman, you can give me your answer in writing. Um, the United States presence in Iraq, should it remain about the same? Should we ratchet up militarily our presence or should we just leave Iraq? Three options. I would imagine there has to be an enhanced military presence, but also an enhanced civilian presence in terms of Iraqi ministries, bureaucracy, and rehabilitating the institution. There has to be a greater degree of American presence, military, as well as the civilian counterparts. Thank you. Chair will yield time to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think everyone, uh, almost universally, whether they favored or didn't favor the JCPOA, acknowledged that they were about eight to 12 weeks away from having a nuclear weapon. That was pretty well understood uh, at that time. So as we're talking about a rejuvenated Iran, in all likelihood, we'd be sitting here in the absence of that agreement, having an Iran that had nuclear weapons. How could that uh, not improve their uh, influence and their malign activities uh, coming from a strong, point of having nuclear weapons to begin with. We're learning in North Korea how difficult that is. Uh, Mr. Byman. Uh, Mr. Keating, I, would, I favored the nuclear deal for exactly that reason. Uh, there are plenty of flaws with it, and we could spend more than this hearing pointing them out, but there aren't particularly good alternatives. And Iran without a nuclear weapon or Iran with a delayed nuclear weapon is better than Iran with a nuclear weapon right now. Thank you, and uh, that's where I did. I, there were flaws, but you, you can't ignore that reality. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, Mr. Berman mentioned uh, the Trump administration uh, is embedded with this. They're not any more embedded than when the president said on day one he would tear up the agreement. So uh, what happened since the election? Well, sir, I I think it's, it's one thing entirely to talk about uh, tearing up the deal on day one as, as part of a stump speech during the campaign season. It's another thing entirely to recognize that the, even though the JCPOA is an executive agreement and therefore uh, can be terminated at the leisure of the next executive, it's actually a multilateral pact. And therefore, uh, the United States walking away from the JCPOA could end up in a situation where uh, American leverage notwithstanding, the JCPOA remains more... Well, 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 wouldn't that have been the case 
just at the time of the signing. It's all clear uh, from th that the other participants in our coalition of sanctions, you know, people, countries in sanctions, uh, putting sanctions on Iran, they were ready to uh, uh, walk away then. And then we would have had the U.S. by itself in Iran with a bomb. But that's just, that's, I think, the real reason that uh, tearing it up day one didn't occur, not because it was embedded, but uh, another question uh, I have too. Uh, again, Mr. Berman, you said that it's the last eight years that there's been uh, a situation where Iran has advanced and gone through, implying that it was just under the Obama administration that that occurred. Nothing happened under the Bush administration. They weren't moving forward uh, towards uh, nuclear weapons and that capability. Nothing happened during that stage? Uh, no, uh, sir, uh, to clarify my point, uh, I mentioned the two terms of the Obama administration in the context of America changing its relationship with the Iranian people directly. Uh, I, I think if you track the change in official rhetoric uh, during the course of President Obama's two terms, and you can see that, uh, for example, manifested in the annual New Year's greetings that uh, every president since Gerald Ford has issued to the Iranian people on March 20th of every year, what you see is a trajectory that begins with communications to the Iranian people. Well, uh, uh, if I could interrupt, you know, uh, we all know that uh, security officials in the U.S. say they give uh, Christmas greetings when they're making phone calls. Uh, but l let me just put that in the context of saying uh, there was a, a, a progression uh, of nuclear uh, development during that year. This is, you know, I think we have to get as much as we can beyond the partisanship here. And that's the reason I'm, uh, I pointed to those questions. These issues are far too important, and that's why I, I, I focused on that. But I must say that uh, I favor, too, uh, very strong sanctions in, in this area. And we can do that uh, with no interference whatsoever with the agreement. There's, there's plenty of options for the U.S., and I support them uh, because of Iran's military uh, ballistic testing. Uh, ballistic missile testing because of their uh, human rights uh, positions and actions, and, and because they were an exporter and enabler of terrorism through the whole reason. So I think we could do that, and there's plenty of areas of agreement in that respect. Uh, so I want to thank you all for doing this and just say uh, on this important issue that we all agree is a central issue to our security, uh, the extent that we move away from branding, uh, political partisan actions uh, will all be stronger. I yield back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Colonel Cook. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. TK, I wanted to ask you, I want to shift gears a little bit. Saudi Arabia, and since we're on the subject of nuclear weapons, there was a lot of speculation about the fact that um, with this agreement that Saudi Arabia would unilaterally purchase or develop a nuclear device be, as, um, because they are the, at least in uh, recent years, the traditional enemy. Have, do you have any uh, comments on that in terms, I know it's hypothetical, but uh, there was quite a bit of talk about it at the time? Uh, I think there were many things wrong with the uh, Iranian JCPOA, the nuclear agreement. Uh, it's a flawed agreement. But I was never persuaded entirely of the cascade effect, namely that other countries would seek to emulate that capability. Uh, for one thing, I don't think the Saudis have the scientific foundation or a cadre to be able to, at this point, uh, man an indigenous atomic nuclear program. And yeah, it, how about a purchase from yeah, uh, a I country mean, I, like Pakistan? I, I, I'm not a Pakistan expert, uh, but should Pakistan have sold a nuclear weapon to Iran, uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia, it would be the first state to actually transfer nuclear weapons to another state it, without precedent. Now, if anybody can break precedent, it's the Pakistanis. <laughs> um, so so I, I, I just don't know enough about Pakistan. Every time I would ask somebody who knows something about Pakistan, they would say they would do it. Okay, can but, I switch gears a little bit? Uh, I want to talk about um, uh, Bahrain and the number of uh, Shia residents there are there and the influence of Iran on a um, pivotal country. Obviously, that's where our fleet is and everything like that. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Because the uh, Bahrain is uh, 
involved in the, the war in Yemen, and which I'm sure is, uh, uh, you know, as part of the Saudi coalition, and whether that is the next, if you will, in this, this domino effect of countries that uh, Iran has supported. In the Gulf today, uh, Bahrain remains a country that has been most vulnerable to Iranian subversion and the activity of Iran's subvers subversion in Bahrain utilizing the Shi'i population is increasing to the extent of, I think, even dispatching arms. So Bahrain is becoming a specific target of Iran's, as they would say, malign activities, more so than I think other places in the Gulf, simply because there have been disturbances there in the aftermath of 2011, and Iran always tries to fish in muddy waters. So I think you've seen a greater degree of its subversive participation in Bahrain at this point. Okay, and the last question or issue I wanted to talk, and uh, Mr. Berman, I haven't uh, picked on you, and uh, I apologize, but uh, the uh, war in Yemen, and particularly the, uh, once again, the Saudi investment in terms of that escalating, this is, tremendous consequences for the Red Sea and the closure of the, the, the Suez. If that continues uh, with an escalation, how do you think that could play out in terms of involvement of those countries in the region in the United States? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll attempt very briefly. Um, I, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that the proper lens through which to view what's happening in Yemen, and uh, incidentally, it's worth noting that Yemen is in the throes of three separate security crises, not simply uh, the civil war. Uh, however, the instability that's localized there now has the potential to have a very large catalytic effect on the safety and security of energy shipping through the Bab al Mandab uh, and other strategic waterways. Um, and it's also, I think, correct to view what's happening in Yemen as, at least in part, a proxy battle between uh, Iranian-supported rebels on the one hand and the Saudi state and, and the Gulf monarchies, the Sunni Gulf monarchies on the other. Uh, there is a, I think, very high potential for escalation because of these characteristics, and it's a crisis that I think the United States needs to navigate very carefully. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Nevada, Ms. Titus. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, we have just heard from the last few days a lot of, about the President's trip to the Middle East uh, and to Israel. Uh, and so we, uh, we've heard him talk about cooperation and new directions and all of that. And that's why I would just point out again that while your testimony is very interesting, and I thank you for being here, it's not all that helpful moving forward. It's good analysis, but we really need to hear from members of the administration to put some meat on the bones here. Just what are the plans? What are the details? What do they have in mind going forward with this new direction? I, I would just ask you quickly, uh, Mr. Berman, you mentioned several times the need to reach out beyond the government to the people of Iran. I wonder if you know what the new budget does to Voice of America, for example. Ma'am, I do. Um, I, I think the conversation uh, about the current shape and content of U.S. broadcasting towards Iran specifically is uh, a work in progress. Uh, I know I, ca I can divulge, I, I have on public forums that my organization, the American Foreign Policy Council, uh, has been asked to do an independent third party review of content relating to Persian language broadcasting. And I hope uh, I will reserve all judgment until uh, the findings of that uh, study come back. Uh, but I would hope that those findings will have an impact upon how the administration sees the utility of strategic communication. I hope so, too, because at a time when apparently we need it even more, it's being cut by about 9 percent. So let's just get that on the record. I would now ask you, uh, Dr. Byman, in your written statement, you note that, and I'll quote you, if you don't mind, the new initiative or form of pressure is going to require our allies. Economic pressure requires support from European and Asian allies, while military and diplomatic pressure requires Middle Eastern help as well. I'd like to go back to the point that our ranking member was making about the nuclear agreement. Another statement that came out of the travels of the president and for Saudi Arabia was that, and I quote again, Iran's interference poses a threat to the security of the region and the 
the world, and the nuclear agreement with Iran needs to be reexamined in some of its clauses. This was a statement coming from the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia wasn't part of that original uh, agreement, so it's kind of confusing. And on the other hand, we we're hearing that uh, Iran lived up to its agreement. Now we're here and we need a new direction involving Saudi Arabia. Could you tell us what you think the other members of the original agreement are going to think about opening up again and looking at some of these provisions and working with people who weren't even part of the original agreement? As you know, the agreement required painful and also painstaking diplomacy. And I think many countries walked away not completely satisfied, but at least getting some sense of what they were hoping for. The problem with opening this up again is that it looks like it's the United States that's doing it when at the same time the United States is certifying that Iran has lived up to its side of the bargain in letter, not always in spirit, but in letter. And as a result, many of our allies would be skeptical of this and I think we would end up worse off than we were in 2011, that the economic pressure that was brought to bear in 2011 would be very difficult to rebuild because the problem would be seen as emanating from Washington rather than from Tehran. My hope would be that we could build economic pressure on other issues, not the nuclear issue, but terrorism, such as the subject of this hearing, for exactly that reason. I think Iran should be pushed to move away from any of its, much of its nasty activity, but doing so on the nuclear agreement without a clear violation from Iran, in my mind, would be a mistake. So you don't think that, say, Russia or China or some of the European countries would think this was a good idea? I hate to invoke Russia or China because I think they would happily rush in to exploit um, any sense of, of a U.S. misstep or uh, weakness, but I would even say real allies, allies in Europe, for example, um, would I, most of them would think it was a mistake. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. The uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Perry. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Berman, looking for, and I think you kind of enumerated some in your testimony, but I'd like to go back through it a little bit. Uh, the Iran's use of the funds uh, released from the JCOPA to increase funding to terrorist organizations and activities. If we could kind of delve into that a little bit. Um, the, the amount to who and how, how that's verified. Thank you, sir. And I'm happy to provide more details. I've, I've written about it and I've documented it elsewhere, so please forgive if I uh, provide uh, sort of, if my uh, incomplete memory. An overview will be good. Um, the uh, Congressional Research Service uh, in July of 2015, uh, about two or three weeks after um, the passage of the JCPOA, was uh, asked by the Office of Congressman Mark Kirk of uh, Senator Mark Kirk to outline what it believed was the scope of Iranian then sanctioned uh, Iran, uh, its funding, it, the scope of its funding for international terrorism. At that time, uh, what was returned by the CRS was not a figure, but it was a range. It was a, a range between $3.5 billion and $16 billion annually uh, at a time when Iran was still constrained by multilateral sanctions. Uh, and that range encompassed everything from between 100 and 200 million dollars annually to Hezbollah to up to six billion dollars annually at that time for support for the Assad regime in terms of troops and materiel uh, to uh, several uh, dozens of millions of dollars for Iraqi militias. There, there were uh, sort of uh, very clear sort of line items that were enumerated in that report, and I'm happy to make that available to you. Um, I think. The sort of the takeaway from the time that has elapsed since has been that uh, while a full snapshot of how much Iran is spending on this portfolio is still incomplete, at least in the open source, it is clear from certain data points uh, in the in the open source press, for example, that Iran has ratcheted up this financial activity with regard to Hamas, with regard to Hezbollah, in a way that's very detrimental to regional security because it expands the threat capabilities of So the at what level, how do we determine at what level and can we, can you with any um, confidence conclude, for instance, missile technology to Moss uh, is, is a direct, uh, is directly attributable to the money that was received from Iran, from the United States as a re result of the JCPOA? Sir, I, I think it would be very hard to point to a smoking gun uh, in terms of direct transfer as a result of the JCPOA. Uh, what I would note, uh, at least for the purposes of this hearing, is uh, the overall expansion of available 
funds that are fungible that Iran can use for a variety of Ob We all get that, obviously, but, you know, so currently the only the IRGC Quds forces designated by the Treasury for its terrorist activities, and I'm thinking, you know, Mr. Mast, my time in Iraq where Iran was, uh, it was directly attributed th their use and manufacture of EFPs, explosive form penetrators, which is a cheap man's sabo round, goes right through an engine block and certainly a human is, uh, you can understand the devastation. Uh, I'm wondering how we're going to, how we're going to sanction the broader IRGC uh, under the requirements designated in the executive order 13224, um, and if we want to, and I, but first of all, I think we should, but maybe you have a different opinion. But how do we justify that? I mean, we, we know these things are, you know, the IRGC is a, a big operation in Iran, controlling most of, of the activities of the country in a meaningful sense. So how do we get to that? Well, sir, uh, in sort of in the very short time I have allotted, uh, I would point out uh, two things. Uh, first of all, there is a policy goal of uh, preventing a full normalization of trade with Iran uh, that the administration has articulated. Um, and in this context, the IRGC is very much low-hanging fruit. Uh, they control a third or more of Iran's national economy. They have controlling interest in the telecom sector, in the construction sector, and various other aspects of Iran's economy. And therefore, a designation would have a chilling effect on, can be expected to have a chilling effect on foreign countries and companies that are involved in those sectors. So what would be the downside and how do you, can you, can we justify it currently? I know we got 30 seconds. Can we justify it currently and is there a downside? I, I think there is a downside. Uh, there's always a downside in, in these sort of designations. Um, I believe that it could create not insubstantial trade disruptions. Uh, between the United States and countries that are heavily leveraged in the Iranian market. Uh, I think this is not an insurmountable obstacle as well. And I think what we'll find is that the lion's share of countries and companies that are involved in the Iranian market are much more heavily leveraged in the American market, and we can force them. I'm not worried about the leveraging with, Mr. Chairman, with your indulgence, the justification. Is there, can there be any justification under the current circumstances to designate the greater IRGC? You mean a precipitating event, sir? I'm sorry. How do we know where they're spending the money? I mean, how do you prove the justification for designating them? If we haven't done it already, what has changed? Well, uh, the lack of a designation up until this point, uh, sir, I, I would argue is, is actually a failure of policy, and it reflects uh, uh, sort of a desire to turn a blind eye to the Okay, so you're saying we currently have the justification. Thank you, yes, Mr. Sir. Chairman. I yield. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from... Uh, uh, California, Ms. Torres. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you to our panel for being here. <clears throat> How could the Trump um, administration's policies towards Russia in recent statements during his trip to the Middle East uh, about Iran affect the United States' ability uh, to pursue its objectives in curbing Iran's destructive influence in the region? Uh, it's a very big question, so I'll say perhaps the most important uh, first step is to restore confidence of U.S. allies in U.S. leadership, and that requires a sense that the United States is going to hear their concerns, but also that the United States is going to become and stay a major player in the Middle East, and that requires a military presence. It also requires a political uh, presence. It requires high-level engagement and requires almost constant lower-level engagement as well. And maintaining those ties, making sure allies are on the same page, making sure we have a uh, plan, that's going to be necessary. It's hard for any administration. And I hope that the Trump administration can, can use any momentum from the recent trip to try to restore and build that coalition and then develop the capacity within Washington to carry that energy forward. Lower-level engagement, as in? Uh, we need deputy assistant secretaries. We need people who are the political figures throughout the administration who are often the counterparts. Uh, any president, no matter how energetic, uh, cannot handle every aspect of diplomacy 24 hours a day. Secretary of State cannot do so. And we need experts and advisors and mid-level officials, and that's, that's vital to any administration's success. 
I was hoping you would say that. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, this subcommittee has previously heard testimony regarding the role of Iran and Russia in supporting the Taliban and the Shia militias. How do their shared security interests impede U.S. objectives in the region, and what options does the U.S. have in confronting uh, those efforts? This is uh, one of the more curious aspects of uh, Iran's uh, policy, in a sense that it's willing to, at times, uh, ally itself with even radical Sunni groups. There are some indications of how some level of relationship with al-Qaeda, there is always a relationship with some members or aspects of Taliban, and Russia has been doing those same thing. In this sense, there is a measure of amorality in terms of Iran's policy, particularly as it looks east in terms of Afghanistan. Uh, one of the ways of combating that, as, as, as Judge Poe has his own uh, legislation on, on the Revolutionary Guards, uh, one of the ways we principally over the time have tried to impose penalties and costs on Iran is through economic measures. Uh, whether they have been successful or not, it's hard to say. Uh, but that economic leverage, I think, is important to suggest. That coercive economic leverage is attenuated because of JCPOA. There are barriers and obstacles to that. Uh, so JCPOA is a nuclear agreement, but its restrictions also affect the prerogatives of the United States in exercising the economic leverage tool that it historically had deployed. Anyone else want to add? If I could, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> I would point out, I, this to me is one of the central questions in our conversation about Russia and sort of where Russia fits. And, and I think there has been quite a learning process that the new White House has gone through. There, uh, in the early days of the Trump administration, there was a lot of talk about whether it was possible to flip Russia. Uh, on Iran, whether it was possible to get Russia to, with a more Pacific relationship overall, to get Moscow to cooperate better uh, on Tehran. But what we've discovered is that this is actually much harder than it looks for a whole host of very practical reasons. Uh, Russia needs uh, Iranian uh, assistance and support uh, in order to preserve a long-term presence in Syria for force projection into the Middle East. Uh, Russia, whose uh, own economy is not doing well, needs those uh, tens of billions of dollars of arms deals that it has now concluded with Iran. Uh, and for these and other reasons, uh, it's, I think, uh, a little bit facile to think about the fact that, that Russia, with enough inducements, with enough uh, carrots, will actually play ball on Iran. I think we need to start thinking more creatively about what tools of leverage we have that can separate the Russians from the Iranians in what is manifestly a very robust strategic I want to partner. get a last quick question in there. What um, cooperation, if any, is there between Iran and North Korea regarding ballistic uh, missile de uh, development? I have, I have 10 seconds, so I'll have to be very brief. Um, I would point out uh, that the strategic relationship dates back to the uh, late 1980s, but it extends beyond ballistic missiles. Uh, every single nuclear test that the North Korean regime has carried out in the past decade has had observers, uh, for, uh, Iranian engineers as observers. And this- uh, On the ground? On the ground. And this speaks to a larger, deeper, and more nefarious strategic relationship, not only on ballistic missiles, but on other strategic programs as well. Mr. Chairman, thank you um, for the 17 seconds. <laughs> You're welcome. I know the State Department's looking for deputy secretaries. I think maybe three are right here sitting in front of us, so uh, you don't have to comment on that. Um, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Garrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, it's, it's sort of trying to wrap my brain around this is, um, is something because, you know, I've only been here for a few months and um, my background is as a, as a company grade military officer and a prosecutor. And yet I look at the JCPOA, which at the risk of getting myself in trouble, I refer to as the JCPOS. And I wonder who wrote it. And what I mean by that is, if you look at UN Resolution 1929 that was controlling in 2010, the wording of the document read, Iran shall not undertake any activity related to ballistic missiles capable of, right? And then under the JCPOA, we were handed language, Iran is called upon not to undertake any activities related to the development of ballistic missiles. Dramatic pause for effect. Right? You don't have to be that good a lawyer and certainly not that experienced a legislator to understand the difference between may and shall or shall not versus is called upon not to. Mr. Berman, at what possible point did any individual commissioned by the United States of America 
and the P5 plus one think this wording made sense, and could you please shed some light onto why? Sir, I can't, and I say this advisedly as a not very good lawyer who is recovering currently. Um, I would point out that, that that language is dispositive, and what you have seen, and it's not only on the ballistic missile portfolio, but on other aspects of multilateral pressure against Iran, uh, where we've seen a watering down in the service of the nuclear agreement. And this is the only explanation I have for it, that in the service, in the hope that we could delay uh, and potentially later derail Iran's nuclear program, we were willing to roll back the language, the compulsory nature of our international restrictions so far. Wait. As we've seen, I think this was a bargain that hasn't manifested itself as a good one. Um, and I think what we are now uh, sort of trying to make up lost ground as a result. So, Mr. Byman, you testified that Iran has lived up to its side of the bargain, and this is a quote in a letter, if not in spirit. I'm not aware of your educational background, but does it, does it shock you uh, that when the previous oversight of Iran as it related to UN Resolution 1929 was, shall not undertake, and the JCPOA, JCPOS, JCPOA says is called upon not to, does it shock you that Iran has, has engaged in ballistic missile activity? Not at all, sir. And does anybody at the table know who it was that we empowered as a nation and where they went to law school who thought that this language was a good idea, right? If, Mr. Chairman, if you'll indulge me for a moment, it's not just about the procurement of a nuclear device, right? A nuclear device needs a delivery mechanism. And so while you might take some short-term windows and say we've moved that back, as we watch with North Korea right now, not in the skiff, we also know that there's miniaturization and mating a nuclear device to a delivery mechanism. And so you t contemplate the terms of breakout. Is it not possible that Iran is angling towards a creep out, knowing that the me mechanisms for delivery uh, are being enhanced under our very nose by language that we allowed, that someone was either criminally negligent or, or was aware of the intent, and that we're going to have a creep-out scenario where Iran not only has a nuclear weapon, but also their delivery mechanism by which to essentially hold it hostage in the entire region, if not the world. Mr. Takei. It, it, a nuclear weapon uh, requires a number of things. It requires the ability to enrich uranium with dispatch. Iran is currently developing the capacity with the advancement of its uh, highly high-level velocity centrifuges, which are permissible by JCPOA. It requires the ability to design weaponization design. That's impossible to detect. Uh, weaponization design could be a room in an office somewhere, so I imagine that's taking place. Third is projectiles to deliver that missile, and that's also excluded from the agreement, and therefore they're developing those ballistic missiles. So the triad of a nuclear weapon is being develop right now. I have, a, I have a finite amount of time. I respect the answer, and I'll, and I'll come back to you. But essentially, it wasn't excluded from the agreement. We included, that is the delivery mechanism development, we included words in the JCPOA right. that at least politicians could come back to the American and, and global consuming public and go, oh, look, we've called upon them not to undertake the development, right? Whereas we all understand may versus shall versus called upon not to. Right, so, so we didn't deny anything other than agreeing to a reduction in the number of centrifuges and, and eliminating plutonium centrifuges, centrifuges for a period of time, am I correct? Uh, and the plutonium capability has, I think, been foreclosed, but not the enrichment capacity, right. uh, enrichment capability. And I, you're right, in the resolution 1929, it was impermissible for Iran to develop ballistic missiles. That language has obviously been attenuated. As thank you, know. and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schneider. Thank you, and uh, I apologize. Um, I'm in another hearing where we're having a vote, so if I jump up abruptly, uh, please don't take offense. But uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your work. Um, I was not able to be here for your testimony here, but I have studied your submitted testimony carefully, and, and I very much uh, appreciate it. I think, Dr. Takei, you describe in your, um, uh, you close in your remarks that in the end, the nuclear agreement offered Iran all that it wanted and go on to uh, identified that. I, I think that, for me at the time, was one of my concerns with the agreement, as well as the, the, the matter of time. But we're stuck with this agreement now. We are where we are. And uh, I'm sure you've talked about in, in previous discussion the need uh, to um, enforce this agreement, enforce it to its letter. Um, Mr. Berman, in your testimony, you talk about ensuring compliance. And again, to the question, uh, 
there, there's a great deal, you say there's a great deal that must be done in this regard. Could you highlight some of the, the specifics of what you see being absolutely necessary and what the Congress can do to move this forward to make sure that we absolutely lock down this agreement for the time we have it to make sure Iran doesn't get any closer to a nuclear weapon? Sir, I can hazard a, the sort of the start of a guess. I, th I think there's a, a more fulsome response that, that requires some study. But I would point out that uh, the current regime, uh, monitoring regime structure that exists under the JCPOA is inadequate for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, it's not fully sourced in the sense that uh, the facilities, the facilities that the United States government believes are Iranian nuclear facilities are not completely covered by the inspections regime that's baked into the JCPOA. There are additional facilities that need to be looked at. There are many facilities that are co-located with military bases that are overseen by the Revolutionary Guard Corps, which are of uh, specific concern. Um, and there's also a, there have been limitations that have impo been imposed by the Iranian regime on uh, free unfettered access for the inspectors that do exist in their coming and going to these facilities. All of these ambiguities, as a start, should be assessed and discussed uh, in order to determine whether or not we have adequate confidence that with this limited regime, we can see everything there is to see. Great, Th thank you. Um, Dr. Byman, I promised Dr. Tay, okay, I'm gonna come to you as well, but uh, Dr. Um, Byman, you, you say that uh, the administration should, and I'll quote you, lay down clear red lines regarding Iran's support for uh, militant groups and, and other things. What are the red lines you see? Again, what can Congress do to help um, state those, articulate them as clearly as possible, but make sure that uh, if those lines are crossed, there is uh, articulated consequences as well? Uh, to say some that I, I hope are obvious and therefore could gather support across a wide spectrum of Americans would be uh, any targeting, of course, of the U.S. homeland or any targeting of American assets and uh, overseas. And one thing we haven't done in the past is we frequently ignored plots and focused on actual attacks, which I understand the political logic of that, but that is crazy because some of the attacks could have easily happened. They were, we were just a little lucky and a little skillful. And so that's where I put the emphasis. Uh, obviously, any transfer of unconventional weapons to a terrorist group should be redlined. The thing I would emphasize, though, is this is something Congress should be heavily involved in because we have to show that this will span administrations, that regardless of who's in the White House, that the United States will act to stop this. I, I, thank you. I can't agree more with what you just said. And, and one of my issues with the JCPOA is that not just administrations, but generations. And my concern with this 15-year term, and we see with the recent election, is that the people who signed this deal on the Iranian side have every expectation that they will be in power when the deal expires and uh, can, can just wait it out. Dr. Decay, I want to come back to you. I want to give you the, the last word. Uh, you, you very, I think, cogently said, uh, and again, I'm going to quote, a regime as dangerous to U.S. interests as the Islamic Republic requires a comprehensive strategy to counter it. Uh, hopefully, we can see a comprehensive strategy coming from the administration in conjunction with working with Congress. But are there things that you believe have to be absolutely necessity be a part of that comprehensive strategy? And again, what can Congress do to further that? Well, one of the things one of the things I would say is, I think has been mentioned before, is the rebuilding of the alliances in the Middle East. Um, those alliances, for a variety of reasons, have been battered in the past few years. And once again, rekindling that particular uh, capability of those. Uh, uh, I would say in terms of hemming Iran's influence, uh, as I mentioned before, I think Iraq is a place where we can more aggressively and effectively push back on Iran. Uh, that essentially is a very important battleground for Iran uh, because it's far more important to their national interests and security objectives than I think Syria is. And it's the place where the United States has a greater degree of assets. Uh, fi finally, I would say, uh, I, I continue to stress that it's important to put economic pressure on Iran, but again, I have to emphasize that ability to impose economic pressure to some extent is, is weakened by JCPOA and its provisions of economic relief that have to come about, particularly in the realm of financial institutions, because one of the things we found out, maybe belatedly, in between 2011 and aftermath, is that the United States has the ability to segregate Iran from the global financial institutions, and that has a real effect on its domestic economy and its ability to project power, subsidize militias, and everything. And I think that particular instrument is now largely, not entirely, but to some extent weakened by JCPOA, particularly in terms of central bank sanctions and so on.
Right. No, I, I think we are limited. I hope that as a body, as was stated, that we can make it clear to Iran that uh, it is the policy of our nation, of, our, of this Congress, uh, not just now, not just for the term of the, the agreement, but forever, that this regime will never get a nuclear weapon. So again, I thank the witnesses for their testimony, and I yield my, um, back my time. And I thank the gentleman from Illinois, and I thank all three of y'all for being here today for your excellent testimony. There may be more questions that members have. They will put them in writing, and they will submit them to the chair, and we'll submit them uh, to y'all for quick answers. Uh, so thank you very much. The subcommittee is adjourned.